So good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to our study this week, as we continue to consider the different aspects that are being presented in this document, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we might be able to, to reveal those things that we have been learning so that we might more properly give an answer for the faith that is in us. Shall we now praise our Father for his guidance and his direction? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you recognizing our great need of you, our desire to walk in the paths that you set before us, and the need that we have to rely upon you, to rely upon your spirit, and to be able to rely on the word that you have left for us. You have provided everything for us, the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, our shelter, everything. There is nothing that we have that has not come from you. Help us now as we continue to study this document. Direct us in the path that you would have us to take. Be with us, show us, guide us in all things. May your spirit open our minds. May your angels attend us and help us so that we may converse, discuss, and assess so that we might more clearly understand that which we need in our lives today to become more like you. Help us to this end. For this we ask, for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, these three paragraphs we were addressing yesterday, and as Glenn had written, in all of the other references of Daniel 11, the relation of the king of the south to the king of the north are clearly defined. Each states that they are fighting against each other, verses 5 to 7 and verse 11. Cast up a mount against the other, verse 15. Sitting at the same table as each other, verse 27. Not so in verse 40. In other words, if the kings of the south and north are fighting against each other, the Bible clearly says so in plain English. It is this relationship between the kings of the south and the north previous to verse 31 that leads one to conclude that the same relationship must also exist between the king of the south and the north after verse 31. <clears throat> this confusion comes from viewing the former engagements of the king of the south and the north in their relationship to each other, rather than to their relationship to the principal subject. In their case, prior to verse 31, they are indeed fighting against each other, but it is always within the context of their relationship to paganism. Paganism is the dominant subject from verse 1 to verse 31. In the case of the kings of the south and the north, after verse 31, they are not fighting against each other, but they are fighting against the king of verse 36, still within the context of their relationship to the principal subject, the papacy. The papacy is now the dominant subject. Now, we ended yesterday's study. We came to this point, and I think we were in agreement that there cannot be three different parties in these verses. Okay. Yeah, and, and of course, his, his argument, you know, that, you know, it doesn't apply in verse 40, when it's pretty obvious in verse 40 to me that the battles between the king of the north and the king of the south, he has to, he has to, and, and he's not, and he's not telling us who they are yet, right? Well, so, you know, because obviously he's not going to have the king of the north, I would think, as, well, maybe he could. Maybe he could have it Turkey and uh, and uh, Egypt, right? So maybe he could still have the same thing. But the problem is that those kingdoms have ceased to exist. The north and the south are part of Greece. And he, he talks about how, well, how does the papacy suddenly become the king of the north? Well, the papacy inherits the power seat and great authority of pagan Rome. So, and, and pagan Rome definitely becomes the king of the north, if we understand how um, how that would be, right? So, you know, they, they conquer 
Syria, they become the king of the north. See, see, part of the problem when when a person thinks about something, so when we think about something, we need to think about all everything, if that makes sense. That is, I can't just try to find a path to where I want to go and ignore all of these other things around me, right? So he has he has an aim in which he's going and he's not addressing other possibilities. Right. And and even the ones that he does address, like, you know, he's saying, well, they've just made this mistake in assuming he, he's not proving it, right? He's he's making a, su- a suggestion, which is not the obvious conclusion from reading the verses. And so you'd have to have a good reason why this is not the case. Now, he, he has tried to use, like, the word him, you know, must be the same him all the time. But, I mean, you can easily go through the Bible and show that that's not the case. That's not how it's not how Hebrew works, but it's not even how English would work in this case. So, uh, yeah. so he's not really proving that. And, and, the, and the other thing that we brought up is, of course, the fact that we have the king of the north and the king of the south as being typical of what's going to happen at the end of the world. The thing that, that had struck me about this is what a close parallel he is attempting with what Uriah Smith had written. He's trying to say that there are three parties here when there are only two. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I mean, it's it's very divergent from Smith's, right? So he's going to have the papacy as being the the king that does according to his will instead of France. Right. I'm still not sure what he's going to, who he's going to say the North and the South are. Right. Because he's what we've had so far and what, what I've seen in, in the next article. So, I mean, if he used Smith's argument, he could just have Turkey and, um, and Egypt coming against the papacy but that doesn't seem to be the case, right? So that doesn't make any sense. So I'm not sure who he could have them be. It, it, like, I just don't see how he's going to sort out these problems that he's created. Now, the next segment, he segues a little ways away and then tries to bring it back to what his main point has been. Yeah, and, and that is he's he's argued that this uh, the correct understanding of the daily is really important in understanding these verses. Right. Though that doesn't really seem to fit in the way that he understands the daily. I'm not quite sure that he understands it correctly. I mean, he just thinks the daily being paganism is all he needs. But here he's going to deal with the time periods. So he begins with a quotation from Jeremiah 50. Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria hath devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. It, it's always intrigued me that this name is either shown as Nebuchadnezzar or Nebuchadrezzar. Yeah, I'm not sure why Jeremiah has it as Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not sure. Okay. Up until the time of the end, the 1798 time period, paganism and papalism were the main persecutors of God's people. These two persecuting powers each ruled for a specific time. The fall of, Assyri- of Israel to Assyria in 723-722 B.C., was the starting point as to when God's people began to come under the control of paganism. From that point forward, Israel and then Judah, after Manasseh was taken captive to Babylon in 677 BC, were never again a sovereign and independent nation. Forty-six years elapsed from the time that Israel was taken captive to the time that Manasseh, king of Judah, was taken captive. So here he begins to address an element of the prophetic mirror, but he doesn't fully touch on it. Yeah. He also repeats an error of Miller's, where it's not true that Judah never again becomes an independent nation. Okay. 
right? Because they, they they do become an independent nation before you know between the time that Greece is in control and and Rome then um, you know conquers them. So I know it's something that Miller says and people just repeat it, but it's not true. Now he comes to Jeremiah fifteen four. And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. They, to which I assume he means Israel, were finally destroyed as a nation in AD 70 and were eventually dispersed among the ten divisions of the old Roman Empire. And until 538 AD, God's people, now spiritual Israel, were still under the control of paganism in the succeeding line of Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, slash the Ten Divisions. From that time period, 723 slash 722 BC, to the removal of paganism and the setting up of papalism in 538 AD, is 1,260 years. For 1,260 years, paganism was the first persecuting power. Likewise, with the papal power, as their rule was from 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D., culminating in another 1,260-year time span. These two powers collectively represent the scattering of God's people. The sum of these two time periods is 2,520 years, and it is described as the <clears throat> indignation spoken of in Daniel 11.36. Paganism and papalism are the same two powers which are rep- referenced in Daniel 8.13, 11.31, 12.11, and 2 Thessalonians 2.7. Any comments on this? Well, um, just to some little minor details that we always should take note of. So he has 723 slash 722. Now, I'm not sure why he does that. So we know that that Samaria is going to fall in 721. Hoshea is taken captive in 723. So I wouldn't put slash 722. I'm not sure why. Um, so more like he's uncertain about it. I'm not sure. I don't think he he has the concept and the understanding of the calendars. Yeah, he may not. Okay, so anyway, yeah, so, yeah. Um, Now, when it comes to the scattering, he says that these two powers collectively represent the scattering, and I disagree with that. Paganism does the scattering. Papalism treads underfoot the city. It's going to stamp God's people. It's going to it's going to um, it's going to be a, a power that that tramples God's people. It doesn't scatter them, right? And the scattering of the power of the holy people, as you see in Daniel twelve verse seven, is is going to refer to the first twelve sixty. So I've seen different sort of versions of this of trying to understand the scattering. Um, probably people have heard the idea that. The 2520 for northern Israel is the scattering, and the 2520 for Judah is the gathering. Have people heard that idea? Yes. Yeah, that was kind of the first thing I heard when I when I came into the movement. Now, that is, northern Israel is scattered, never to be gathered, right? Right. It is. We, we have, with Judah, of course... And, and even with northern Israel, we have the spirit. It's changed from literal to spiritual. So with with um, Judah, it's going to be scattered um, in that period in the four seven times. And then it's going to be restored. Right. So, I mean, they get back to the land. They rebuild their temple. They're given their government again while they're under Persia. Now, they're going to be subjugated to Greece for a time but not the whole period of time, you know, that, that Miller had. Um, and uh, so when we deal with the gathering that happens, like with Northern Israel, spiritual Israel is going to be gathered. That is the Protestants in 
1798, they're going to have this opportunity to receive the first and second angel's message as well, particularly the first angel's message, which they reject. I mean, a group of them, of course, become the, the Millerites, right? And then they're going to uh, be tested under the second angel's message. So there's a lot of confusion about the scattering and the gathering. Now, I remember, of course, when I first came into the movement, I heard about it. I was, I um, can't remember who pointed it out. But one of my scripture songs uh, called He Shall Feed His Flock, where I got the part, you know, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd and shall gather the lambs. And then I have this other part that's sung over top of it in one of the verses. Uh, As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he's among his sheep that are scattered. And the word gather and scattered happen at the same time. Right. You know? And, and and so that to me was kind of interesting, especially since I wrote the song in 1989, you know, at the time of the end for our generation here. So it was just kind of interesting. So so I spent a lot of time anyway, thinking about this scattering and gathering and trying to understand it because I heard different views. And and then also we have the statement in early writings, page 74, you know, uh, where Ellen White talks about uh, the Lord recovering hand. Um, stretching out his hand to recover again the remnant of his people a second time, right? Now, of course, that is, that gathering that's being referred to in, in the Bible is the second time is when they, they come out of Babylonian captivity, right, in the context of what it's talking about. And Ella White makes an application, though, about the scattering time and the gathering time which which she then qualifies in a footnote, right? Everybody's aware of that? I believe so. So so I, I still think there's kind of confusion about it here. And and he's he hasn't sorted through this, right? That is, I think there are a lot of things that we think that we've heard that we haven't actually thought about. And and these details are rather important to put them all together. And so what I see here is just, for lack of a better word, kind of a sloppiness in how he's dealing with this information, right? He, you know, he talks about, well, you know, we have these views, long held views that, you know, are wrong, um, but he's not really examining his own thinking. Like he's not examining each piece of this puzzle to put it together. Right. So if we, we use the analogy of truth is like a puzzle and we have we have all these pieces and we, we don't know. We don't have the, the final picture yet. Right. So we don't have the box with the picture and the puzzle on it, but we have these pieces and we know that there are spurious pieces in there. Right. So there are pieces that are going to appear to fit. But as we start to form the picture of those pieces, we, we, we put them in somewhere and we start to realize, well, you know, this piece isn't even from this puzzle. You know, or I put it in the wrong place. And if he's going to do a study like this, where he's going to now sort of turn everything on its head, he needs a lot stronger evidence and he needs to not just throw things at us without, without examining every piece. Does that help a bit? It's correct. The, the the point that I'm looking at here, he wants to have us consider the entirety of this 2520 mm -hmm. as the indignation. I don't think that's the case. Well, well, there's the last end of the indignation, and there's the first end of the indignation. So, so we addressed that. But he just kind of says, well, the whole time period is the indignation, which is true, I think. Um, but it is it's got two ends to it. Right. That is, it has two twelve hundred and sixty year periods, which, of course, he, he sort of understands. Right. Because, I mean, he talks about them here and he understands one's for paganism, one's for papalism. But he hasn't really put this together and how this relates to Daniel chapter 11. And of course, we didn't really put it together until this year when we, we spent so much time on Daniel 11. 
especially the latter part of Daniel 11, where it's going to talk about the indignation, where it's going to talk about the time of the end and the time appointed. And so we, we now know how this fits together better. And he doesn't know any of this, right? He's, he's not studied this. So what he's putting together here is, is partly correct, but it's, it's missing things. Okay. Now, Next, a quotation from Science of the Times. Through paganism and then through the papacy, Satan exerted his power for many centuries in an effort to blot from the earth God's faithful witnesses. Pagans and papists were actuated by the same dragon spirit. They differed only in that the papacy, making a pretense of serving God, was the more dangerous and cruel foe. Through the agency of Romanism, Satan took the world captive. Science of the Times, 1st of November, 1899, paragraph 5. Then from the great controversy, in Matthew 24, in answer to the question of his disciples concerning the sign of his coming and the end of the world, Christ had pointed out some of the most important events in the history of the world and of the church from his first to his second advent namely the destruction of Jerusalem, the great tribulation of the church under the pagan and papal persecutions, the darkening of the sun and the moon, and the falling of the stars. Great Controversy 393.2 Mrs. White gives us an interesting insight and principle concerning the scattering and gathering of God's people. Here he quotes from Review and Herald, November 1st, 1850. And I believe we did quite a study on this. September 23rd, the Lord showed me that he had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people and that efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. In the scattering, Israel was smitten and torn, but now in the gathering time, God will heal and bind up his people. In the scattering, efforts made to spread the truth had but little effect, accomplished but little or nothing, but in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their desired effect. Their designed effect, excuse me. All should be united and zealous in the work. I saw that it was wrong for any to refer to the scattering, for examples, to govern us now in the gathering. For if God should do no more for us now than he did then, Israel would never be gathered stretched out his hand the second time. This is written in 1850 and is referenced to the 1843 and the 1850 prophetic charts. The 1843 chart contains the first and second angels' messages that are based on time, and the 1850 chart has the addition of the third angels' message that is based on events. See Great Controversy 392.1, early writing 7475, along with 236.1, Five manuscript release, 202.4 to 203.1. The first time God stretched out his hand to recover the remnant of his people was when the first and the second angel's messages were given from 1840 to 1844. These messages were expressed on the 1843 prophetic chart. The second time he stretched out his hand was after Christ moved from the holy to the most holy place in 1844 which was expressed on the 1850 prophetic chart by the addition of the third angel and the sanctuary. In the gathering time, we are no longer dealing with the literal persecution of pagan Rome and papal Rome, but are now confronted with a new persecuting power, that of apostate Protestantism. Here we are again. We're now introducing a third situation. How do you see this? How should we approach this? Well, so first, I don't know if he fully understands what Ellen White's saying, right? And he's making a lot of statements that he's not proving. And and some of them are just, you know, I, different things I've heard people say, but it doesn't, there's nothing logical here. Like he's not following through logically in what he's introducing and how he's trying to make an argument or make his case. Like, like, and he has this paragraph here. 
In consideration of this, it is essential to understand that just as apostate Protestantism rose to power after the scattering time was completed, so the kings of the south and the north also become active after the scattering of God's people has been accomplished. Had been accomplished. Like, does that make sense to anyone? And and how would he show this? And I don't think his his main argument is correct anyway. Well, the premise that the initial two give rise to one, along with some of the other applications, I'm just I, I'm having difficulty sorting this out. Yeah, that's what I'm having. To do. Like an Ellen White says, uh, the view that the Lord had stretched out his hand the second time to recover the remnant of his people on page 74 refer, refers only to the union and strength once existing among those looking for Christ and to the fact that he had begun to unite and raise up his people. So, it, I mean, it could be... Uh, it, because I'm not really sure what that means exactly as far as the second time. So to me, the second time would refer to, so one, the union and strength once existing among those for looking for Christ. So that's going to be, he's saying that's going to be the first time. And right. The, and he began to re- unite and raise up his people again. I guess that would sort of makes sense. So she's just comparing, she's using this story to compare the two. But she's not, she's not arguing for what he's arguing for, right? Regarding the scattering and the gathering. Like, I understand, you know, that in the past, like when I came into the movement, people would talk about the scattering and the gathering and being the two 2520s. And then uh, they would use this Ellen White quote. But it seemed to me that nobody really understood what what the quote meant and and how how that related to the 25 point it's just the fact that it's talking about the scattering and the gathering right and you, you understand what i'm saying like so for me it's not precise enough like i need to understand something i need to know the reasons why somebody's saying something not just look at common words and just somehow connect connect that. So when we talk about the scattering and gathering, when the Bible talks about it, it's talking about Egypt and Babylon, right? So they're going to be scattered in Egypt, they're going to be scattered in Babylon, and they're going to be gathered in the Exodus, and they're going to be gathered in the Babylonian captivity. Right. Now we know that the 2520 for northern Israel is going to have a scattering, plainly stated in Daniel 12, verse 7. But it's going to refer to the first part of the 2520 for northern Israel, not to the second part. So you're going to have the scattering, then you have the treading down, and then you have the gathering, I guess. So so is the gathering one of the periods? Is there something that happens at the end of the 2520? Or, you know, you understand what I'm saying? (laughs) That we've never really defined this. So, I mean, obviously there's something here, but it, it's never been well defined. It's never been well presented to my satisfaction anyway, that there's some kind of consistency. So what I would argue is that we can't just take this quote of Ellen White and connect it in the way that he's connecting it. The, the next segments as written, I have to question. Now, granted, Ellen White wrote, I saw that it was wrong for any to refer to the scattering, for examples, to govern us now in the gather. It is at the time of the end that the king of the south and the king of the north become active. The scattering time has been completed, and the kings of the south and the north are introduced in the gathering time. They are no longer bound by the conditions of the scattering time. Who's they? The king of the south and the king of the north. Okay, so that makes no sense. Agreed. Right. So he's trying to argue that we can't. So his argument, I guess, because he doesn't really explicitly state it. So he's saying the king of the north and the king of the south fighting against each other. That was happening during the scattering time. Now that we're in the gathering time, the kings of the north and the kings of the south, we don't follow that pattern. 
because they are no longer bound by the conditions that happened during the scattering time, that there was conditions for them, right? That's what he's arguing. Okay. Right, which Ellen White's not talking about the kings of the north and the kings of the south, right? She's talking about us now, and what is it that that now that we need to do that we... <laughs> That this that this gathering time, in the way that she's talking about it, uh, what is it that we need to do? Because this is about our actions, right? So when we we look back at this this passage in page seventy four, right? So there's going to be a reason why she writes this. So the Lord showed me that He had stretched out His hand a second time to recover the remnant of His people, and that the efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time. So, in the scattering, Israel was smitten and torn, but now in the gathering time, God will heal and bind up His people. And the scattering efforts were made to spread the truth, but had little effect. So, I, I take it that she's talking about the scattering as being after the first disappointment, right? They weren't able to accomplish spreading the truth. That's what I understand. But in the gathering, when God has set his hand to gather his people, efforts to spread the truth will have their designed effect. So we could sort of apply that uh, to us right now. In a sense, we're in the scattering time, right after July 18. But there will come a time that our efforts will be fruitful, right? That, that the message is going to go forward. All right. So this has nothing to do with conditions for the king of the north and the king of the south. Right, but that's how he's arguing it. Right, so it is at the time of the end, the king of the north, south and north become active. The scattering time has been completed, and the kings of the south and north are introduced in the gathering time. They are no longer bound by the conditions of the scattering time. The conditions he must be saying is that they fight against each other. Okay, does, does that make sense to people how he's making this argument? Like everybody understands what he's trying to get at. Am I getting it correct, or am I not getting it correct? I see you as being correct on this. <clears throat> I'm having a problem because this segment of statements mm -hmm. sets aside all of the historical applications that that we have been addressing and that have been addressed before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's true. Though my main problem is that he doesn't know how to tell us what he thinks. We have to we have to really dig to even kind of get what he's getting at, which is okay. It helps us to think things through, but but it's like he hasn't really thought these things through, right? And and there isn't a logical flow of thought. No. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've I've talked about this before, but I, I sort of look at writing kind of like an art. And I learned from my brother David, you know, that when people look at a painting, you know, their eye goes someplace first and then it goes someplace next. And, and you need to be aware of where you're leading the person's eye. And it's the same when you're presenting something you're you're wanting. The person should almost anticipate what you're going to say next. Right. Right. There, there should be a logical flow of thought so that the person reading it can say, oh, yeah, I know where he's going. Oh, yeah. I see that. Yeah, that makes sense. He dealt with this problem that I had before. So now I can see why he's saying this. Is he going to say this next? This other thing that I'm thinking now. And then he does, right? <laughs> right? That That's, but but he just keeps going in these directions that don't make any sense to me. And, and, and he could have written it so that I would know where he's going, right? One is he could. One thing is you kind of tell people where you're going, right? Right. And and, and he hasn't. He, it's almost like he's been misdirecting us the whole time, uh, like a ma magician using sleight of hand. He doesn't want us to see where he's going, and so you know he's sort of hiding where he's going because when he gets there, he doesn't think we're going to be too happy about it, but. <laughs> I don't know. That's my impression. Okay. He continues. This holds true for the United States and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, both of which arose at the beginning of the gathering time period. 
So is he giving a comparison that the United States and the Seventh-day Adventist Church are the king of the north and the, and the king of the south? Or is he trying to make a different application? I'm not sure. And and I've not been a- reading through this. I've not been able to figure out who the king of the north and the king of the south are. Okay. As a nation and as a church, we are not under the conditions of the scattering time of paganism and papalism. The same holds true for the powers of the bottomless pit, atheism, and Islam. It is interesting to note that the first and second woes were bound by the conditions of the scattering and under the constraints of prophetic time. Not so with the third woe, that of modern Islam. It rises during the gathering time and can only be identified by prophetic events. The principle of the scattering time and the gathering also coincides with the shut door and the open door of October 22, 1844, when Christ moved from the holy place to the most holy place. This is when Protestantism experienced its moral fall and the door closed to them. At that point, it moved into its phase of apostate Protestantism. On that date in history, we are moved into the anti-typical Day of Atonement. Mm. So he's attempting to address this as a point rather than a period. Well, we know the door to Protestantism closed with the ending of the first angel's message. Right. October 22, 1844. But I don't even see his, I don't see his reason for introducing this as part of his argument, other than he wants to bring in apostate Protestantism. So, yeah, I'm not sure where he's going. Well, okay, one, one of the segments that we studied had to do with William Foy. Mm-hmm. and the sixth trumpet. Yeah, so the sixth trumpet sounds all the way to October 22, 1844. In this situation, he's not understanding what Foy had to say, which which we have studied and have, has, have accepted, at least as far as I'm concerned, we've accepted this. I mean, if if others haven't, I mean... No, I, I mean, no we, we all understand that the, the sixth trumpet completes its sounding on October, because the seventh trump begins to sound on October 22nd, 1844. The okay. woe ends before the trumpet finishes. It's like the trumpet, the sixth trumpet, or the fifth trumpet begins, and it's going to be a long time till the first woe. Right, so the woes in the trumpets are not, the trumpets, uh, the woes occur within the trumpets. Right. They do the same thing, right? And in our period, uh, the third woe is going to begin at 9-11, but the seventh trumpet sounded October 22nd. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's necessarily just having to do with the trumpets here that's the problem, though. I mean, he's, and, and I'm not sure what he means, the third woe, that of modern is it real. It rises during the gathering time and can only be identified by, by prophetic events. That is, it doesn't have a time period attached to it. But that's not really true. Right. So we have shown that 9-11 does have time attached to it, that we couldn't have predicted that time. But but it is connected to the prophetic periods connected with the first and second woe and with the, the 2520 and the 2300 days and 70 weeks. I mean, it's all it's all interconnected. So. Right. Yeah, there's just. It just doesn't seem logical unless, you know, once he gets his his third 13th paper done, that we'll understand why he's introducing all of these different powers that he's talked about and the conditions that they're no longer under, right? So he's saying that the United States, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, atheism and Islam, they're no longer under the same conditions that they were during the scattering time. And, and and what are those conditions particularly? Uh, one of them is that that they don't fulfill their role typically, right? Yeah. Right. The king of the north and the king of the south. They, they're they don't we don't have to look at their past history to understand their behavior now, right? That's what he's saying. In a way of speaking out. Yeah. Which 
if you're going to remove those constraints or those conditions, and he says, right now we have no conditions that they were under during the scattering time and no constraints of prophetic time. Well, that just opens up any wild interpretation you want to have, right? We would understand prophetic interpretation is based upon understanding that history is repeated. And he's going to say, no, the history isn't repeated now because we're in a different time, right? Am I getting that correct? Is that what he's arguing? I don't have a better point. Okay. And this next paragraph makes no sense. The shut door and the open door can also apply with equal force to the scattering and gathering time periods. These two periods represent the grand overall operating systems and the precedents that were set at the beginning of each, in turn, set the conditions that govern how they operate. I'm impressed because this is a wonderful example of circular reasoning. Yeah. But it's not taking us anywhere. No. And I'm not sure what he means by the shut and open door can also apply with equal force to the scattering and gathering time periods. Now, what does he mean by that? It's not very clear. And to say the two periods represent the grand overall operating systems and that the precedents that were set at the beginning of each. So when they begin, there's some precedent that's set and that those conditions govern how they operate. But there's going to be a change once those periods end. So there's kind of these constraints during this period of time. And he's going to connect this in some way with the open and shut door. Okay, the next paragraph. The change from the dispensation of the scattering to the dispensation of the gathering is the dividing line when the world began to move from a system governed by principles based on a monarchy to those of republicanism and civil liberty. It is where history moves from the confines of prophetic time to that of prophetic events. This line is where the rules which govern the identity and function of the kings of the south and north of verse 40 are set in place. These kings no longer function in the context of a monarchy, nor are they bound by the conditions of the scattering time period. This is an illogical statement. Yes. So he's arguing here that we have dispensations, right? So he's going to use that term. Now, we understand the dispensation is what? What defines the dispensations of scripture? I don't know how to express that. Well, it would be different periods in which, like you would have a dispensation where you don't have a temple, right? Like before the sanctuary. You just had sacrifices at home. Then you have the temple. To me, dispensations all relate to the different forms of worship and access to God. So, in other words, worship in Eden was one dispensation. Worship at the gates of Eden was a different dispensation. After the flood, it's a different dispensation. And after the altar coming into the first, the sanctuary is represented before the temple is built is a dispensation. And then after the temple is built is a dispensation. Yeah, that's the way I understand it. And there's a dispensation that we would have, you know, from when Christ begins his work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And then we're under a different dispensation in the time of the day of atonement. That's how I understand dispensations. So he's using this word, which I take as a specific word to refer to something in scripture. And he's just going to put this and attach it to the scattering and the gathering as dispensations. Right. So I have problems with that because he's good at putting some of these these ideas together that if you don't know anything, they make sense. Is that fair enough? Yes. OK. You know, so somebody reading it who doesn't know and understand 
what we understand about scripture could just say, well, there's this kind of, you know, internally, you know, interesting idea that, that you don't need to really understand it to sort of be impressed by it is, is the way that I would look at it. It seems like he's organized this idea. And if you understand it, just a little bit, you know, you can kind of say, okay, you know, this kind of makes sense. But it's not biblical. So he's going to be arguing that that there's scattering time, which I don't agree with him about the scattering time, what it is. But uh, he's he's going to argue that uh, that these these types that are occurring in there, they, they operate under these rules during that time. But we're in a different time. But we would have to show that we're in a different time and that in a different time, those rules don't fit. But we we're told throughout Scripture and we've seen that all the Scripture is a repetition uh, in our time. It, we're repeating those histories. So we have line upon line that helps govern us. But he he has this new idea to govern how we interpret um, the time we're living in, right? So we can't we can't use these examples, right? If we can't use the examples of the scattering to speak about now, then we can't use these stories to illustrate what's happening now, right? Isn't that in, isn't in that, a way? I mean the the problem that I'm having with this uh, is when when he wants to call this a dispensation. Well, gathering to dispensation of gathering it it just isn't it, it's not tracking with me mm -hmm. it's not making sense i don't understand what he's trying to to approach yeah now his next paragraph this is where the united states of america the sixth kingdom was raised up to demonstrate to the world the true principles of Protestantism and Republicanism as opposed to the system of monarchy. Monarchy is defined as a state or government in which the supreme power is lodged in the hands of a single person. All these, all of these several events are what set the conditions for the gathering time period. These conditions consisted of principles of monarchy based on prophetic time, the fourth and fifth kingdoms in power, persecution and exile, repression of conscience, and the church brought low. Here he gives his reference from Great Controversy 252 and 290 to 292. I don't understand what he's trying to say here. Well, he, he's just trying to say that that there are principles that we've had before and, and we can't we can't use those because he's really going to try. To me, this is just to argue that we can't have the king of the north, the king of the south be fighting against each other. Right. But he, he's trying to support it, but he just keeps supporting it by making more and more assertions. Um, that he, he's not demonstrating. They, they sound logical on the surface, right? But but they're not consistent with with the scriptures, and and he hasn't really presented any real arguments for them. You know, I mean, it'd be like if you know, I have this idea for uh, a car, right? So I'm going to have this car. It's going to have this this engine that doesn't use any energy, right? And I describe all how this engine is going to work and everything. Except that none of that explains how it's actually going to work, right? You know, I talk about all the qualities it's going to have, but how is that going to come about is never said, right? It's never stated. So, you know, so he has this idea, but it's it's not something that would naturally flow from from the studying of the scriptures. It's kind of put together from different ideas which which aren't correct he's got all kinds of assumptions that he's built in for this <laughs> i don't know maybe somebody else can make more sense out of it but but his argument is we don't have monarchy right because the united states rises 
So that means there were conditions that existed before. Now we're going to look at things in a new way, right? Right. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It teaches that history will be repeated. The end from the beginning. Yeah. And, you know, the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. But if we can't look for examples in that period to tell us about what's happening now, then that contradicts the scripture. It, it, it's just such a, a strange idea that he's presenting. You know, the idea is, Eloy takes this statement about we can't look for in the gathering time uh, the same things to work in the scattering, which, which to me has to do with evangelism. Right. But he's going to now apply it to interpreting prophecy, which she is not. Right. We can agree. Ellen White's not doing with that statement what he's doing. With it. Can can we agree on that? I would. Anybody? Think so. Right. So now he's going to build this whole theory up. That so that when the king of the north and the king of the south are evidently fighting against each other, that they're not. They're fighting against the papacy. It, it's such, it's creative, you know, it's an interesting idea, except it's just wrong. And he doesn't give evidence for it. You know, he's, he's explaining his idea. His, his explanation of the idea is the evidence, right? Well, because I can explain something doesn't mean it's, it's correct. This next, this next paragraph stating the entire span of the ministry of Christ in the holy place was conducted in the scattering time period, while his ministry in the most holy place, the antitypical day of atonement, is performed in the gathering time period. Now, he just, in a, in a prior paragraph in this document, attempted to state that the scattering was under paganism, Unto 538. So, well, he connected the papacy too, but but he he also said that there is a second gathering time. So there's a gathering time in the Millerite time period and a gathering time in our time period. That's what I understood he said. Okay. Now he's saying that that gathering time in the Millerite time period wasn't a gathering time at all. Okay. Right. So so I mean I take the position that just paganism does the scattering and. The, Scattering is not done by papalism, so I don't I don't have the scattering having anything to do with papalism at all. That's the treading down, the trampling, right? So, and, and you can see why because scattering doesn't happen during the papal period. God's people are scattered by these pagan powers, and and they're going to continue to be scattered. Uh, you know, Christians are. But you don't see a scattering occurring. You see persecution occurring during the papal period. No scattering occurring. Okay. Point taken. I'm just, you know, this application of holy place, most holy place, scattering time, gathering time, I think it's a stretch. Yeah, I just, I don't think it's correct. And especially since Ellen White has placed a gathering time in the Millerite time period, prior to October 22nd. So in this in this particular statement, he would be in disagreement with the spirit prophecy. Yeah, with the quote that he gave us. But, but she is just using a parallel from the Bible dealing with the second gathering that happened under, right? So she's just, the Lord has stretched out his hand a second time. And so she's going to apply that. We have the Millerite time period. We had the great disappointment. Now we're going to have a gathering time, and that gathering time, we're going to be prosperous because after the disappointment, to promote the truth, there was little effect. But now we're going to have this opportunity again to spread the truth, just like we did during the Millerite time period, which was also a gathering time, right? So, so my understanding is that there, there, there is a gathering time. There is a gathering time for Northern Israel. That's going to happen in 1798 to spiritual Israel, but it's connected to the 2520 for Northern Israel. Scattering happened in 1260, then a treading underfoot for 1260, 
And then Protestantism is given the first angel's message. That's a gathering time. Right. And in that gathering time, they're going to close their probation, you know, April 19th, 1844. Right. But you have uh, Millerites who are then going to be tested under the second angel's message and their door is going to close October 22nd, 1844. And then you have a scattering that happens after that. That, that scattering Ellen White is using in a typical sense, the scatterings of the past say, God's going to gather his people again, right? So even though we have this disappointment and, and God's people were scattered and peeled, right? Now we're going to have a gathering time. So that's what she's saying. She's not saying anything like what he's saying. She's not saying anything about like, you know, the king of the north and the king of the south, because that was during scattering time. We can't we can't use those examples to understand what's going to happen in our time with the king of the north or the king of the south. And the king of the north and the king of the south, we're going to put it in 1798, which he says is still a scattering time. Right. So he's just internally inconsistent in what he's trying to show. You know, it, I mean, if he was, if we were in a court and he was giving his statement, we would just point out all of the uh, the inconsistencies and the self contradictions. It's like you must be lying because you can't keep your story straight, sort of thing. You understand what I'm saying? It's like he's making this up as he goes, but he hasn't thought it through. And you know, and sometimes it takes time to think things through. So I'm sure I should say a lot of stupid things that I haven't thought through. But, you know, one of the advantages we have of studying is we, we can talk about things, we can go over them again and again and sort through them so that, you know, if I do write a paper, it's usually I'm not going to write a bunch of stupid stuff in a paper. <laughs> we're going to have thought it through. We're going to have discussed it. It'll make sense. But this isn't making any sense. No. Yeah, and and I, I sort of hate being in this position, like, to look at what he's writing and, and say these things about it. But he needs to know this. Like he needs to know that this doesn't make any sense. And he needs to have discuss it with people and go through and then point out the problems. I think this is a good example of what happens when one is studying alone and is not able to consistently study with others. Yeah. I mean, even Miller, I mean, he studied on his own for two years, but he's kept sharing it, you know, with friends, not publicly. Right. Right. So people knew about what he had included. But then, you know, once he start begins sharing it, I mean, it's being examined by others. Right. And so you know, we're examining what he's presenting right now, what Glenn's presenting. But we need to be able to show to him that, you know, this doesn't make sense. This is Sometimes we come up with an idea and we think it's a good idea, uh, but it's not, right? So everything that comes into our head doesn't always make sense. And so you have to spend a process of time of working on the idea and seeing where it goes. And... You know, people even write scientific papers. Uh, I was watching a, a YouTube video guy talking about uh, computer science and how um, that there's all these these discoveries in computer science that can't be replicated because somebody did, you know, they did some research, computer programming research, and then they write a paper about it. And but it's just doesn't make any sense. Right it's not any useful knowledge because nobody can replicate what they did. You know, it's sort of like some kind of accident. And, and so, you know, we need to recognize that just because we have an idea and even if it can make sense to us, it's got to be useful, right? It has to, other people need to be able to understand it. I mean, that's always been a problem that I've had is make sure I can think lots of things, but are, are they useful? And and the other thing is, are they true? Right. That's why we spend time examining is what we believe to be true. Like I have an idea about something. Does it does it does it pan out as I work on it? Right. And 
So, you know, there's no way that what he's doing is going to go any. Like, I can't imagine people reading his paper and saying, this makes so much sense. And, you know, a whole bunch of people agreeing with him. Like, it's not a well-formed idea. So just as it took 46 years from 722 to 677, so I'm not sure he put 722 there. Right. I mean, that, that again shows a misunderstanding of the calendar and misunderstanding of of how these time periods should be presented but well, this also, he's not looking at the details right the details are important well uh, but those are minutia i i know so but they, they are important because right. from these details we learn so much if we consider this paragraph in light of the preceding paragraph, I know. <laughs> the logic becomes even harder to follow. Yeah. Just as it took 46 years from 722 BC to 677 BC for the scattering of Israel and Judah to be set in place. So it required 46 years from 1798 to 1844 for the conditions to be fully set in place to allow for the gathering of God's people. I mean, I understand what he's trying to do here he, because he's made this argument about the scattering occurs through this whole period of time, right? 25, 20 years. So it has to end, but, but, but there's two different 2520s, which he hasn't really addressed specifically in how they're connected. He's trying to do that here so that there's this preparatory time. Now, like to say that 46 years for the scattering of Israel to be set in place, I'm not, I'm not sure what he means. So from 742 to 723, uh, we're going to have this period of time in which this, uh, that 19 years and then and then uh, northern Israel will be no more, right? And then you have the 46 years to when Manasseh is taken captive, right? So, so you're going to have the scattering of Judah. But the scattering of Israel has already happened. Right. You know, in, in that sense. I mean, literally Israel has been scattered, never to be gathered. Now you now some people argue well in six seventy seven they're going to be scattered but it's actually that's just when the land gets repopulated by Esser Haven right so that's when he's going to repopulate Israel it's been uh, abandoned for you know forty six years there's still a few people living there but it's it's basically just gone into disuse so he's going to put people that he's taken captive from other places and put them in the land of Israel. So that's not really a scattering. But then he's also argued that um, there was a gathering in the Millerite time period. But so he's maybe trying to connect that. Well, in this 46 years, that first gathering under the Millerites sets conditions for the gathering in 1844 or something. I don't know. But, He's using time. Well, he's, he's using time to 1844. Right. Not after that. But this with the gathering. Yeah, the 46 years is a gathering period, not a scattering period. Right. So maybe he's saying that gathering sets conditions for the other gathering that's going to happen after 1844. Right. I think that's what he's trying to say here. There's... There's just a jumble of ideas here without anything connecting the ideas properly. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I like to think my papers are organized and logical. I, I hope they're not this bad. Well, you know, you know, because sometimes things can make sense to me, but not to other people. But right. But I usually I'm pretty sure that I'm logical in how I think things through and how I present things. But this is not logical. Like his this whole article is it's it's probably the worst one out of all the articles so far, and not just because he's he's coming to his conclusions, but just because of of just the lack of any any real argument. 
for what he's saying. And plus what he says in the conclusion here. Well, do we want to get into this part of the conclusion right now? Yeah. Okay. We got eight minutes. In this article, we have looked at two principles, the plain reading of Daniel 1140 using Miller's rules, along with the accepted rules of the English language and the application of the scattering and the gathering. So, so, I mean, this is a really good conclusion in the sense of he did do that, except that he didn't, right? I mean, he didn't really look at the plain reading of Daniel 11 using the accepted rules of the English language. And he didn't use Miller's rules, though he thinks he did, but he misinterpreted that rule because he didn't use the accepted rules of the English language to read Miller's rule. Okay. The next paragraph. For the king of verse 36 to become the king of the north, a change in the wording of the text would be required. Where have we heard this kind of an argument before? Well, this is um, Smith. Right. Without exception from verse 31 through the end of the chapter, every he, his, him, and himself refer directly to the papacy as the king of verse 36. Papacy is the main subject. So he's taking that, he's using the equivocation, he takes Miller's word subject, and instead of understanding it as a grammatical term, he's going to use it in, in a way that uh, he means the context of a passage. Correct. Right. And so obviously he would not be using the accepted rules of the English language when he's going to say every he, his, him, and himself is going to refer to the papacy. It's not using Miller's rules and it's not using accepted rules of the English language. Agreed. Daniel 1131 is a dividing line that separates the work and methods of the two persecuting powers that scatter, paganism and papalism. How is Daniel 1131 a dividing line? Well, that's, that's where the daily's taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up. But, I, I mean, the, the situation that we have is that when the daily is taken away, paganism is set aside. The abomination that maketh desolate is papalism. Yeah, so paganism, papalism. So you got, now, paganism scatters, papalism doesn't. But he doesn't realize that, right? Okay. So he, they're both persecuting powers, but they operate differently. Right. Right. Paganism is going to scatter the power of the holy people. Papalism doesn't scatter the power of the holy people. Right. It's going to persecute. It's going to right. just torture people and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Daniel 1140 is also a distinct line that serves to separate two specific things, but in the larger context. And at the time of the end is a line drawn in 1798 that separates the two overriding systems of operation, the scattering and the gathering. So, again, when he's got the scattering and the gathering, and he went, now went, wishes to place the scattering as occurring before 1798 and the gathering after? I know, that's where he's inconsistent, right? Because he sometimes puts it after 19... Or, 1844 and sometimes after 1798. I, I don't quite understand this argument. 1798 is the dividing line. He's, he's going to try to argue, I guess, there's this 46 years right. that is needed for the gathering to be set in place. So it's kind of a transition period, maybe, from 1798 to 1844. So, so the scattering occurs up to 1844, but the events from 1798 to 1844 prepare people for the gathering that's going to happen afterwards. That, that's the only thing I can gather from what he's saying. But that, 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 that must be what he's trying to do. But these, these ideas again, you know, so he's going to repeat his other idea because this is his conclusion. Each system has their own conditions which govern their, op govern their operation and are not, not interchangeable. It is a change of dispensations, which also signals a change in operating methods. What was successful under the conditions of the scattering must now be adapted to meet the conditions of the gathering time, time period. So 
you know, connecting this to dispensations, which is a misuse of that word from a biblical perspective. Right. The operating methods, this idea that there's different operating methods makes no sense. We don't find this in the Bible anywhere for the spirit of prophecy. And then when he says what was successful needs to be adapted to meet conditions of the gathering time period, that's not what Ellen White says. Not at all. No, she just says, basically, we were successful in the Millerite time period in spreading the message. After the disappointment, we've been hindered, right? But God, we're now in the gathering time again, and God's going to, you know, our efforts are going to be rewarded, right? That's basically what she's saying. Now, he's going to, I know I'm kind of finishing, I just want to finish this this paragraph here. In the kings of the south and north, you, we find two specific entities that are raised up as a check against the ideologies of the papacy as expressed in both civil and moral. So this is a completely new idea. Right. And, and these two kings are not at war with themselves, neither are they satanic, but rather they are godly in nature and are raised up as a check to meet these ideologies of the papacy. So the only thing I could gather from the king of the north and the king of the south which which he hadn't really stated. I mean, he said that they're not satanic, but this is the first time that he says they're godly. So right. he's getting the king of the north and the king of the south as being godly powers and that are raised up to check to meet these ideologies of the papacy. Now, I'm not sure what he's going to say. There's so many different ways he could go with this. I mean, he could argue, you know, it's the separation of church and state, the two horns of, of the beast, you know, the civil and the religious. I mean, I still have no idea what he's he's going to say, what he's going to ultimately conclude. But anyway, our time's up. But. Okay. We will return to this, finish this portion tomorrow, and then segue into article number 12. Any other thoughts or comments? from what we have covered today. Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together. We thank you for this time of study and fellowship. We ask now, Father, for your watch, care, and your guidance. Help us to consider carefully these principles, these points that were presented, direct our thoughts, our actions, our words, so that all that is done today may be for your glory. To the glory of your name, to the glory of your character, to the glory of your kingdom. Help us now that we may be readied for your kingdom. In this, Father, we thank you. In this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.